worked on improving how cattle are handled. And I'm now a university professor at Colorado State University. Tony Hernandez Pumarejo, writer and author, professional and motivational speaker, TV presenter, life coach, an international ambassador for autism and mental health. He is proud to invite you to his podcast, My Time, with Tony Hernandez Pumarejo. Hi, and welcome to this new episode of My Time with Tony Hernandez Pumarejo. And this is your host, Tony Hernandez Pumarejo. If you haven't done so yet, I invite you to please subscribe to my podcast in all platforms, YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and many, and many other platforms. And I really appreciate everybody who is tuning in to either watch me or, or listen to my podcast. And today we have a very, very special interview with a a leader, a person who I look up to, who has been an inspiration for me, and not only for me, but also for our community, our autism community, which is the one and only Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Temple Grandin is a designer of livestock handling facilities and professor of animal science at Colorado State University, where she teaches courses on livestock behavior and facility design and consults also with the livestock industry on facility design, livestock handling, and animal welfare. Dr. Grandin obtained her Bachelor's of Arts in Franklin Peace Pierce College and her Master's degree in Animal Science at Arizona State University, and she received her PhD in Animal Science for the University of Illinois in 1989. Dr. Grandin has appeared on national television on channels like CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, and many other channels. In 2010, uh, Time Magazine named her one of the most, uh, one of the hundred most influential people. She has authored over 400 articles in both scientific journals and livestock periodicals on animal handling, welfare, and facility design. And Dr. Grandin, she's the author of different books like Thinking in Pictures, Livestock and Handling Transport, Guide to Working with Farm Animals, and her, and, the, and especially in her books on animals in transition and animals make us human were both on the New York Times bestseller list. Her latest book, Visual uh, Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People with Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstraction, was also on the New York Times bestseller list. Her life story has been made into an HBO movie called Temple Grandin, starring Claire Danes, which, which won uh, seven uh, Emmy Awards and a, and a Golden Globe. The movie shows her life as a teenager and how she started her career. Uh, 2017, Dr. Grennan was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame, and in 2018, it was made a fellow by the American Association for Advancement of Science. And Dr. Grennan is one of the first autistic people to document the insights that she gained from her personal experience with autism. So without further ado, let's take you to the interview that I had with the one and only Dr. Temple Grennan. And today I have a very, very special guest. A one of the kind, you know, a person that I look up to and proud to say that it would, it, without her and her leadership and in her influence, I would not be here right now. I'll be interviewing today the one and only Dr. Temple Grandin. Well, Dr. It's Temple great Grandin. To be. Thank great you, to Dr. Be here Temple today. Grandin. How are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. How's, how's life treating you? Oh, busy. A lot of travel. I've got a lot of tra a big long trip coming up, doing some, uh, uh, a psychiatrist meeting, uh, horse meetings, cattle meetings, mm -hmm. going That's to good. a bunch of different meetings, doing talks. Well, I know you're a busy, you're a busy person, and it means a lot for me to have you in in my podcast. It means a lot. So thank you again, Doctor Temple Grandin, oh, for being in my time with Tony Hernandez Pumarejo. And to begin, this is I'm going to begin with this first question. This is a question that I ask everybody who comes into this podcast. I wanted to ask you, how would you describe the the life of Dr. Temple Grandin in a few words? Oh, that's very hard. <laughs> I'm, I was a severely autistic child, no speech until age four. I want to um, praise all the excellent teachers I had, my mother, 
for pushing me to develop my skills. And I, I design cattle handling facilities. I design them all over the country. I've worked on improving how cattle are handled. And I'm now a university professor at Colorado State University. Perfect. And I want just a few words. Definitely. And your story is truly inspirational as having impact in our, you know, in our world throughout, throughout generations. And Tempo, I want to go a little bit back, you know, in terms of how it began. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, you know, your roots, um, you know, and if you can tell us a little bit about your childhood. Um, I had excellent early education. I had no speech. I had signs of very severe autism, no speech at all. I went into a very good early education program at age two and a half with a lot of emphasis on learning speech, learning how to wait and take turns at games. That's really important. How do you wait and take turns at games and then skills, things like brushing your teeth, uh, putting clothes on, learning skills. Uh, there was absolutely no emphasis on eye contact. There was never any emphasis on that. And I think all that does is overload the child's sensory system. My program of speech, skills and learning how to wait and take turns then that reduces impulsive behavior um, and then i went into a normal school small normal school for elementary school old-fashioned 50s structured classroom uh, that worked for me i was good at art my mother always encouraged my ability in art i think it's so important to take the kids uh, thing they're good at and build on it if the kids are good at math then he needs to be taking the more advanced math classes, but don't uh, make him take baby math. He's going to turn into a behavior problem. Uh, high school was a nightmare of teasing and bullying. Um, that was the worst part of my life. Got out of a regular school, ended up going to special school. And they immediately put me to work cleaning nine stalls every day and running the school's horse barn. I didn't do any studying. But one thing that was not allowed is I wasn't allowed to become a recluse in my room. I had to attend meals, I had to attend classes, I had to attend the chapel, I had to attend all the events, and I basically ran the school's horse barn. I learned how to work. That is really important. I had a great science teacher who finally got me turned around, who was showing me through interesting projects that studying was a pathway to a goal. Never could do algebra. Hmm. And that's the, uh, I'm very concerned that people that are visual thinkers like me are getting screened out with all the higher math requirements. And I discussed this in my new book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. And I managed to dodge algebra. I had to drop a physics class, drop a biomedical engineering class, I had to drop all the things I wanted to do and majored in psychology. I right. wanted to learn more about myself, but I also had to dodge the math classes. Yeah, I've never been good in the math classes either, Temple. And, you know, we're going to touch base in a little bit in terms of what you just said. But before we do, I want to ask you, with everything that you were going to as you were growing up, what was the moment or at, or what age that you felt that there was something different about you? When did you first learn about autism? Well, it was kind of gradual. Uh, you know, I had a good elementary uh, school time. And one of the reasons I did is Mrs. Deach, my third grade teacher, explained to the other children when I was not there that I had a disability that wasn't visible like a wheelchair and they needed to be nice to me not be uh, uh, bullying and teasing so I managed to get through elementary school without being bullied and teased and that's actually called peer mediated intervention and I have a paper that reviews some of that literature that's titled how horses help a student with autism make friends and learn how to work and there's a section in there on peer-mediated intervention. Now, some people are going to say they can't do that for privacy reasons. But that enabled me to get through elementary school without being bullied. And also, the classes were very small. So all the kids were invited to everybody's birthday party. So I didn't get left out of that sort of thing. And at what age were you diagnosed with autism, Temple? Well, I'm... 76 years old so when i went in at two and a half i was taken to a neurologist that he she didn't even know what he, they didn't even know what autism was and and they just said you have no epilepsy that's a good sign and um, they kind of said i was brain damaged and she referred me to a speech therapy school that two teachers just ran in the basement of their house and 
Those teachers did the same thing that teachers do today. Okay. And they just had the knack of how to work with me. But I can't emphasize enough parents that are out there that might have a two-year-old or a three-year-old that's not talking. The worst thing you can do is to do nothing. You already have a diagnosis. You have no speech. And as long as you rule out deafness and you rule out surgically correctable stuff wrong with the mouth, the therapies are pretty much the same regardless of the labels. You yeah. better get started. And if you're in a place where there's no services, get some grandmothers to come in and work with the kid. They know how to work with kids. Uh, I talked to a lot of parents. There's one uh, hour of speech a week. That's not enough. But you can use that one hour of speech a week to coach other people to work with the kid. You've got to start working with them. And the other thing is a good teacher gets progress in the three areas I just discussed. And the kid likes going to therapy. Kids should like therapy. I know there's been a lot of controversy about ABA. There's mm -hmm. all, there has been some really horrible ABA. Um, but so much of it depends upon the teacher. I've talked to a number of parents with three-year-olds, their kids loving ABA, ABA and making progress. Now, I think where ABA sometimes really gets wrong is the kid's older. No ABA type stuff was done with me when, by the time I was seven and eight years old. Definitely. You know, it, was kind of, it was phased out. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very, you know, it's very, you know, I can tell you from experience, it's very frustrating in terms of these debates happening in our community, not only with ABA, but also in terms of the language of autism, whether autism is a disability, identity, the different definitions of autism, especially from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Well, the problem, the, problem you've got, the problem you've got to get asked all the time is autism diagnosis increased. Well, in the 80s, the DSM, you had to have speech delay to be autistic. And then the Asperger's came in there with basically autistic, no speech delay. Now it's all merged together. And I have grandparents come up to me at almost every single conference. And they discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. That's been happening over and over and over again. And it's the milder types. You know, there was no speech delay. I think in a more where there's no speech delay, it's just a personality variant. Now, but then you get others where they never learn to speak. They may have epilepsy on top of the autism. Uh, yeah, that's definitely a disability. But I also want to tell everybody that some of those nonverbals that don't speak can learn to type independently. And mm -hmm. there's some very good books from people that type independently. And if you have a seven or eight-year-old that doesn't speak, you need to read these books. I'll tell you what they are. They are Tita Makapadehe. Don't ask me how to spell that. How can I talk? If my lips don't move, that's my favorite. And then there's Carly's voice. And then there's The Reason I Jump. And there's a sequel to The Reason I Jump. That's a better book. Gives you more insight. He has more insight. I get the sequel. And these are people that type completely independently. Now, I want to tell you a little secret about the typing independently. There's an attention shift issue. So you need to either use an iPad or a similar tablet. Because when you type on that virtual keyboard, the print appears next to the keyboard. If on, on this laptop, I got to look down like this and look up like that, to see the writing. They cannot make the attention shift. Mm -hmm. Same thing, laptops are just as bad. Now, if you have a desktop and that's all you got, put a box on the desktop, get the keyboard right up there next to the writing. Now, there's also fancier things that you can buy, but I also like to tell everybody the way they can do it with stuff they can just find. And don't tell me you can't find old tablets around. There's lots of old tablets and their price is free. If you just look for them. Definitely. And I think that all of this can be summarized, Temple, in terms of being, for parents being being proactive. You know, be active to help your child develop their, the necessary skills to become independent in life. But, but unfortunately, sometimes, you know, some, I'm not saying all the parents, but there are parents that put limitations on their children, do you think that these limitations um, are because they want to keep their children in a comfort zone, or they want to protect them from the realities of society? What do you think? Well, I think part of the big problem I'm seeing is I, there's a lot of emphasis on academics. I'm seeing very bad situations. The kid's excelling in academics, but hasn't learned, learned one life skill, hasn't learned how to work. I just the other day talked to a dean of a college. And uh, this lady had a magna cum laude, whatever, college education, 
never learned any work skills and she's a recluse in her room. That's a couple of months ago. This is right now. I've got to learn work skills. And my mother was concerned when Mr. Patey, the head of my the special school, you know, I was out there cleaning horse stalls and not doing any studying. And he said, let her get through her adolescence. She'll make up the academics. And he was right because I learned the work skills. I was proud of the fact that I was in charge of the school's horse barn, yeah. that I had that responsibility. Yeah. And I never did learn how to do algebra. And I'm worried that um, for us visual thinkers, people who think in pictures, that it's going to screen a lot of us out. Um, I think they need to be allowing some other type of math, uh, geometry, business math, maybe statistics. And I want to touch base with you because you talk, this is, you know, your main point, one of your top topics in terms of the different thinkers in yes. autism. If some, you know, if you can go over that, you know, if somebody. Yes, I sure can. Mind. That's in my book on, on visual thinking. There's also a young reader's version out now with a really, really cute cover called Different Kinds of Minds. And it's written for middle school level kids. And it has pictures. I get asked why visual thinking doesn't have pictures. Well, a publisher wouldn't said they were too expensive and wouldn't let me have them. Um, but there's scientific research that shows that there's three different basic ways of thinking. And a lot of normal people are mixtures of these different ways of thinking. But you get a label. I don't care if it's autism, dyslexia, ADHD, some label. You'll tend to be an extreme of one of these thinkings. I'm what's called an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a photograph. I see it. I'm, I don't think in words. The words narrate the pictures. And I, people with my kind of thinking, terrible at algebra because there's nothing to visualize. I'm good at art, all kinds of mechanical things, all kinds of mechanical stuff. In my work with the, with the beef industry, I worked with people that owned big metal working shops that were definitely undiagnosed autistic. And when you look their names up on Google patents, you get a whole bunch of patents. They're inventing things. So art, mechanical, photography, working with animals. Those are things that my kind of mind are good at. Now, the second type of mind is your visual spatial pattern thinker. This is your mathematician. This is the autistic kid who's gonna excel in math. And music and math, they tend to go together because they both are patterns. In fact, some mathematicians say that algebra equations are almost like musical scores. Well, I don't relate to that. Um, then your third type is the autistic kind of extreme word thinker. These are the kids that love uh, facts. Don't They love history. They love facts about some favorite subject. It could be, uh, you know, movie actors in certain movies, things like this. And the kind of job they'd be good at when they grow up is what I call quiet specialized retail. And examples of this that have been successful, selling new cars, selling sporting goods, selling specialized business insurance, selling cell phones, you see, these are all things where you work one at a time in a store and people respect you for your knowledge. I was just in Walmart the other day. There was like a 20 phones at Walmart, all different kinds of plans. Well, where do you start? And the good person in sales and this doesn't shove the most expensive phone down somebody's throat. They pick out the right phone for that person. And that is something that they appreciate. I call that quiet specialized retail. Because usually those environments usually are fairly quiet, so you don't have a lot of sensory issues. Because I'm always looking at the jobs. On uh, mathematicians, it would be computer programming, music, physics, um, and and then normal people tend to be mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. But I'm concerned that my kind of visual thinking is going to get screened out, and the people I work with that own these big shops, uh, they're my age or a little bit younger. They're retiring out. They're not getting replaced. We need visual thinkers like me. If you want to have the power on, the water on, you're going to need my kind of mind. And I wanted to follow up with you, and 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 you, and I'm and I can connect relate to because you know based on what you said because I work in sales in terms of my working experience. But you know, following up in terms of you know you know what we can do as a community 
in society in terms of the visual thinkers. What we need to do, temple, in our society to bring more of a visual thinkers that can make that difference in our society. Well, I would, what it mainly would do is change. It, it, not Why does everybody have to take algebra and go through all of this higher math? Um, if you're going to be um, a chemist, yes, you have to take algebra. Uh, there's a lot of uh, scientists. If you're going to be a degree in engineer, you have to take algebra. But what I found on the building of the food processing plants, my kind of mind makes all the mechanical equipment, invents it, not just builds it, invents it. And the degree mathematicians do things like boilers and refrigeration, stuff that requires that higher mathematics. You see, you need to have both. And I call the visual thinkers the clever engineering department. And that is where we're losing skills and the other big mistake that was made is people shut down in-house engineering departments worst thing they ever did now you got to import this equipment from italy and holland because mm -hmm. we're not making it so there have to be like reforms in our education system yeah we'd have to you know what i would recommend i'm not suggesting getting out of all of my math maybe go geometry maybe substitute algebra for geometry or maybe statistics or maybe business math, so you can run a business. And Temple, um, I wanted to share with you a little bit of a story because I had the honor and privilege of meeting you in person in one of your conferences a couple of years ago in Miami, in which I remember that you did a Q and A, uh, and I, you know, you were talking about the importance of the parents uh, teaching and developing the skills for their children to get them out of their comfort zone. <clears throat> and I remember one time in which you know, you know, I stood up. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if you remember or not, but I stood up and I, and I said that I'm an, I'm an autistic person working in sales as a store manager. And I remember that you congratulated me and you came to my table, we shook hands and then later we changed our books. I have your book here. Oh, great. Great. The yeah, autistic yeah, brain. And then some of the discussion, different kinds of minds. Now, yeah, and, and, and you even what, what, what do you sell? Yeah. And well, I, I used to work in, 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 in sales and customer service for 10 years. Right now, I work for the autism community full time. Here's my here's your signature. Okay, great. Yeah, this is something that sales. I, what 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 um pro, what kind of a product were you selling? Well, I sell well for my years in customer service. I work in you know retail, um you know specialized services like construction. Um, you know those are the services that I did for my ten years in customer service as as a manager. Well, no, and that's that's really good. And that, what I'm seeing today with a lot of teenagers, I'm seeing bright teenagers doing well in school, never gone shopping by themselves, never ordered food in a restaurant by themselves, never done laundry, never done budgeting, not learning any life skills. And, and a lot of moms are afraid to let go. Um, I've run into two 12-year-olds at the air, different airports, and I found out they hadn't gone shopping. And I gave this one girl a $5 bill and I said, go in that shop across the hall and buy something. And we could see the shop. It was right there. We were sitting in the gate waiting for our flights and we could, I could see the shop. She, and she um, bought a drink and brought me back to change. It was the first time she'd shopped by herself. Hmm. You know, this is ridiculous. I was shopping by myself when I was eight. Hmm. And Temple, um, you know, going along those lines, because, you know, going through a little bit of my, my work experience, I think I mentioned to you, you know, you know, some time ago that you released an article about the different jobs, recommended jobs for, you know, visual thinkers. Yeah. And, and this, and some of that's in my other book, The Autistic Brain. It's got lists of jobs in it. Yeah. And, and I remember because I, I think I mentioned to you that I work as a cashier, you know, and I think that was one of the jobs that, you know, not recommended, you know, for, for artistics. Um, well, and it depends upon how busy it is. Yeah. You know, I was just in Walmart just the other day. And it wasn't very busy. The cashier job would have been fine. Uh, the thing that's hard is rapid multitasking. The worst job now, when I talk about jobs not recommended, is a chaotic, busy takeout window at a McDonald's. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, I, talk, I, I talked to another family, and their daughter was doing very, very well doing, running a cash register at a McDonald's. But they made a little accommodation. When the store got super busy, they had her clean tables. They just made this simple little accommodation and she was able to handle the cashier job most of the time. 
And when it got too busy, they gave her something else to do. Definitely. And I can relate to that because working in that retail environment is a very fast paced environment. Sometimes it's slow. Other times it's busy. When it got busy, a lot of times I, one of my challenges that I have, you know, especially with autism is anxiety. I can get very anxious. I can get pressured and overwhelmed, especially with short-term working memory. And people, well, however, people ask me, how did, what did I did to survive in that environment? And I told them it was repetitive behavior, long-term working memory, because retail jobs tend to be repetitive long-term. And that's what helped me to survive in those jobs, uh, Dr. Grand. And, and so well, that's, you know. <laughs> the other thing that will help, I think a lot of people survive in jobs is I cannot remember long strings of verbal instruction. And a lot of jobs would be saved if you just made pilots checklists. Okay, let's say you're starting out. How do you close out the Walmart cash register? Let me just write down the steps like a pilot's checklist. Sort of an external working memory. Um, there's been some people that have lost good jobs because uh, they they worked for f building fencing, for example. This is an actual example, and and the uh, they he got a new boss, and the new boss went yak 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 yak, and he built the wrong fences, and they fired. Him. If they'd spent two minutes just writing down what to build that day, that would not have happened, and put it in a bullet point format, not in a narrative format, like a pilot's checklist, and look those up online. Uh, that's a simple intervention that would save a lot of jobs. We're talking about resources and support. I like to talk about specifics, Perfect. absolute specifics. The most chaotic multitasking, rapid multitasking jobs, let's avoid them. And um, I can tell you right now, we've got one coming up, Christmas time wrapping station. Mm -hmm. Chaos. Let's just avoid that. <laughs> and then the pilot's checklists. Uh, let's say I have to uh, clean an ice cream machine. Take apart steps, cleaning steps, reassembly steps in checklist format. Because employers get mad and say, well, all right, show them how to do that three times. He's stupid. Mm. Well, you have the checklist, then that's not going to happen. It's a very, very simple intervention. Another one is LED lights that flicker. I would say that bothers maybe 10, 20% of, of people with autism. You know how you find out the bad, you pull this thing out. And you film the lights in slow motion video, you'll find the bad ones. <laughs> and uh, a lot of university lecture halls have this problem. Well, try to get over by a window. And if there's no windows, then you better buy an LED light that does not flicker and you put it on your desk. Definitely. Yeah, I'm always trying to figure out a simple thing that you can do. Uh, I don't talk about accommodations in the abstract, <laughs> I talk about the one, but there's certain accommodations where they come up all the time. The checklists, super, super important accommodation. Definitely. And Tempo, now I'm going to switch and um, you know, talk about more about your work and your profession. You know, I, and we know that you were, you know, you're a professor of animal science at Colorado yes. State University, and you've been folk working for decades in terms of designing yes. yeah. livestock handling facilities. What got you interested in, in this area? I got exposed to cattle in high school. Students get interested in stuff they get exposed to. So I'm a big believer in exposing young young students to music, woodworking, uh, sewing, cooking, theater, all kinds of different things. And then you can see kind of what they gravitate towards. And I got interested in cattle and I went out to my aunt's ranch. And you can't get interested in something that you don't get exposed to. First of all, it's exposure and then mentoring. Now, I had a lot of problems in the early 70s as a woman going into the cattle industry. But the way I sold jobs is I'd show off my drawings. This is one of my drawings. It's in my earlier book, uh, Thinking in Pictures. And I simply learned to sell my work. Portfolios to show off work. I had, and I started a little business on my own designing facilities. And then I also wrote about them. You know, That's started right. out really small, designing facilities. And I didn't interview with clients. I just showed off the work. And, and Dr. Temple Grandin, what are, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in this field? Well, being a woman, and especially when we be out on the job, 
where I had problems was with foremans. It was not the owners of the of the ranch or the feed yard. It was not the owners. It was the middle management, the foremans. They felt threatened. That's where I had the problem. But there also were some people in the cattle industry who were very good to me. There was a small contractor uh, who was a former Marine Corps captain. He um, reached out to me to have, him, have me design jobs for him. He was a very important mentor. We built jobs together for 10 years. Mentors, it starts out in a career exposure, then mentoring. And, and Dr. Temple Grandin, um, you know, your story has been one of, if, if somebody asked me about the story of Temple of Dr. Temple Grandin, is you're, you're a very persevering individual. You put a goal in, in, in mind and you go ahead and, and achieve it. And, you know, going along those lines about your life story, uh, Temple, uh, can you tell me? Well, uh, the other thing is mm -hmm. I saw doors to opportunity. There's a scene in the HBO movie Temple Grandin where I go up to the editor of the State Farm magazine and get his card. Because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would really help my career. I saw that door. And then after I designed a facility, I would write about it. And do you think that was one big challenge that you were able to overcome in your life? Or was there any other challenge that well, you Well, yeah, I had a lot of problems with anxiety that worsened as I went through um, my 20s. Got worse and worse. Health problems got worse. Colitis, nonstop colitis that wouldn't stop. Um, and and then I had a very, very stressful eye operation. I had a little skin cancer on my eyelid, and I had to do plastic surgery while I was awake to take it off. Really horrid. I got really stressed out over that. And, and I went on antidepressant medication for the anxiety. That's all discussed in my earlier, my... 27 year old book thinking in pictures it's discussed in that medication saved me the colitis cleared up in about two weeks now the mistakes this made with antidepressants is too high a dose i'm taking a starter dose it's a starter dose or less that's all explained in thinking in pictures even though the book is really old now the drugs haven't changed there's really no new drugs that's in very fact, interesting. Investors are pulling out of the psychiatric drugs because they can't find new drugs. But now with Chat GPT, uh, it may find um, some new medications. But antidepressants work for anxiety. And uh, I've been on them for 40 years of taking an old fashioned tricyclic. This Prozac wasn't invented. Um, I've seen horrible messes when people have gone off of effective drugs, where they've been on something that's been very effective, very stable, and then they go off of it. And it's been very, very bad results. But then on the other hand, too many kids are given too many drugs. It's disgusting. I'm yeah. taking one med. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of, <clears throat> of medications. I'm just being honest. Um, I'm just trying to find ways to take care of myself naturally, exercise, good food. and Well, I do exercise. and I. But the problem was the, see, the anxiety was coming from within. And the thing I've kind of observed, us visual thinkers tend to be more nervous. And the people that tend to be the history lovers, they tend to not be so anxious. But the anxiety was, uh, it's what scientists call endogenous. It just means from within. My nervous system was, you know, had fear going on overdrive for absolutely no reason. Definitely. You see, anxiety, and then, yeah, anxiety for me has been one area that I've always tried, I always have a fight every day. I still, I even tried CBD one time. The CBD gummies to try, you know, to work with my anxiety, but it's been, it's always been a process for me. Well, the other problem is, is they've on this with the marijuana, they've got the THC level up so high on that, that there's problems with some people getting paranoid and having all kinds of bad reactions. You know, the pot. My generation was much my older. I'm. But they you know, be careful what you take there. The THC levels are seven times higher. I went on the PubMed database and was looking at medical articles. And I was, it's scary stuff. Exercise, yes, I do that every night. I do my 120 old lady push ups. That used to be 100 sit ups, but then I got sciatic nerve problems. Couldn't do that. But I find this burst of heart exercise that helps. 
that's very impressive and and the way you take care of yourself with the demands you know that your your life and profession ha has brought in is very something that is i well you know well respect uh dr grandin i want to ask you this very you know important question for me how much you know impact and influence your parents had had in your life and continue to have in your life well my mother was extremely important when i was young i was eight when i was eight years old i did not know how to read and uh, mother taught me reading reading out loud from a the wizard of oz book and taught me how to sound out my words and uh, no complic I, i can't believe all the complicated nonsense they have online about phonics this was done really simply i already knew my alphabet i already could sing my abc song and that is half the sounds and then she just had me memorize the sounds and then she'd read a whole page and then she stopped in that interesting part had me sound out the three or four words then she'd read some more so i could get into the story and then i'd sound out some more words and by the end of one semester of doing this three or four times a week um, i went from no reading to sixth grade level reading i uh, i was a phonics learner you know now other kids learn more the way chat gpt learns they're actually trying to teach them to read by predicting the next word and then some kids are just straight sight words they just memorize sight words you see this is where you have different kinds of minds of reading you know do what works and for me phonics work for another kid sight words work that's very interesting and and that's great that you shared you know this experience uh temple Uh, another question I wanted to ask as as we wrap up, what is one thing from Dr. Temple Grandin that people may know may not know about you? Oh, I don't know. I like chocolate, but I think people know about that. Definitely. Um, but they the thing I want to see the kids that are different get out there and be successful. I also do a lot of talks to business people, you know, with my book Visual Thinking, uh, to explain to them that we you need these skills. You need the skills of the different kinds of minds. You know, right now, um, uh, nobody's fixing elevators. And you want to get a kid off the video games? I'll tell you, my kind of mind, car mechanics, automobile mechanics has been very successful in quite a few cases. There's a man named Danny Coombs, and he runs something called TACT, and he's teaching young autistic adults to fix cars, and car dealerships are hiring them instantly instantly um and they discover that the uh, motors are more interesting than video games when it comes to video game design um, artificial intelligence is going to take that totally over totally but the, it's not going to take fixing things and even if cars go all electric there's still been plenty of sensors and stuff on those cars that has to be fixed definitely in terms of you know working on those jobs that wish you know you know hard skills you know make, you know trades mechanics that are needed and that people and we need people well, the visual okay. thinkers like me trades are something that's my kind of mind to be good at now you take the mathematicians chemistry physics i just read an article in today's science magazine that chat gpt and other artificial intelligence things are going to invent all kinds of chemistry stuff um Yeah, that is, uh, computer programming. I can see AI taking over. If a job is hands-on, it's safe. A nurse is not going to get replaced. A teacher. You know, any, anything that's hands-on like that, not going to get replaced. Those jobs are safe. But I can see a lot of computer programming going out, especially the lower-level stuff. People that fix computers, I mean, I had to call Chris last night. He installed software. He installed the same software that hackers use to steal people's bank accounts. Right. And then he can get into my computer. Uh, and I don't bank on this computer. And I never will. As long as I can. And banking on phone. Never. Never. <laughs> Definitely. And the key here is to adjust to those to the realities and the changes happening with AI and the impact in well in I'm the, watching uh, with AI very very closely and fixing cars and fixing elevators elevators mechanics is not going to change unless we get anti-gravity like Star Wars vehicles that, that's nowhere in the foreseeable future the elevators are going to be the same mechanical devices 
that they've been for years and years and years and years. And they require fixing. And I've been on a whole bunch of very questionable elevators lately. Mm. Because they're not getting certain. And we need the people. We need the people. And these are jobs that my kind of mind would just love fixing elevators. Now, I was happy to see some younger people at Denver Airport the other day working on the moving sidewalk. Um, but um, no, these are skilled, you know, don't, in other countries, they don't stick their nose up at the skilled trades. And these are the jobs that AI is not going to take away. Definitely. And then live concerts, live concerts, live theater. If you're into doing that, that's not going to go away. Oh, it makes me so happy. The Rolling Stones are my age, and they're going to fill our our stadium. Definitely. I want to see these teenagers be successful. I have another book called The Loving Push, and um, uh, a lot of parents of teenagers like that book because it kind of motivated them that they got to get the kid doing some stuff. Now, you don't shove them on that super crazy McDonald's takeout window. That you don't do. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, and I think it's too much emphasis on interviewing skills. We need to be doing a lot more backdoors into jobs, just, you know, through contacts, uh, getting uh, uh, getting kids into jobs. But I'm seeing a lot of parents just can't let go. For those older adults that get diagnosed later in life, it's a relief because it explains why they have relationship issues. For a 16-year-old uh, that's fully verbal and doing well in school, the labels holding them back because they're not learning life skills. They're not learning work skills. Yeah, it's and about, it's, we it's, need to start out with with um, little kids having chores, and then 11 years old, we've got to replace the paper route. Okay, what do we replace it with? They got to do a task on a schedule outside the home, where somebody else is the boss. Walking the neighbor's dog every day. It costs nothing to set up. Maybe a church volunteer job. Maybe at the, working at the farmer's market, working at the community center, something where it's on a schedule outside the home, uh, at least weekly. Definitely. Dr. Grandin, before we, before we wrap up, what final message do you have for society in regards to what you believe and fight for every day and what we must do further to help people with autism around the I world? I want to see them get good jobs. Because I have friends who shared interests. And some of the most fun stuff I ever did was on construction jobs. Some of the most fun stuff to talk about is how to build things. I find that's really fun. Friends who shared interests. Okay, let's say you have a kid who's fixated on cars, a particular type of car, or Thomas the Tank Engine, something like that. Well, then let's broaden it. Well, Thomas has lots of friends of other different kinds of trains that we can learn about. You see how I'm broadening it, freight trains, passenger trains, subway trains, airport trams, the whole bunch of, Thomas has all these other train friends. Okay, now what do they do? You see how I'm getting broadening that and making it less fixated. You take a fixation and broaden it. Learn about the history of the railroad, read about railroads, um, what kind of stuff do the trains haul, all kinds of stuff. I'm you broaden it. No, but I want to see these kids get out and, 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 and doing things. And I, there's a whole bunch of stuff about identity. I've thought about that. My primary identity is career. That's what's made my life satisfying. And I've taken the money that I've made from speaking engagements, and I've put 22 students through master's or PhD programs, and three of those students are now university professors. And that's what I've done with the book money and the speaking engagement money. I pay to put students through graduate school. That's amazing. And I've had, and I've had several that I think were undiagnosed autistic. Yeah. And one that did extremely well out on a job. No, your 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 you know your mission, uh, temple, you know, speaks for itself and the impact that continues to have around the world. Not only for autism, but people that want to out there go to go out there and make that difference. And I'm truly honored and you know for for you for being an inspiration for me in my life and for well, millions well, of people that's, in the world. And that's really good. Now in your sales job, I want to ask you, mm -hmm. how did you get into your 
your customer service and your sales job. Well, I, I think that'd be helpful for people to know about. Well, I applied for I, I I applied for the position. This was years ago. I went to the interview. Um, I was uh, my focus was to do um, to focus on how I can help the employer, uh, and you know this is how I can help the employer. And despite overcoming the anxiety, and I was able to get that job in customer service, my first ever job more than ten years ago. So you just went the regular interview route. Yeah. Okay, that's how you got in. Where I kind of went more in the back door going up and getting that card half of all good jobs are back door so how did a how did a a kid from the midwest end up working at apple on phone hardware um his professor knew somebody at apple that's an example of a back door see as a visual thinker i don't think in broad generalities i think in examples now for example one of the reasons i recommend the pilot's checklist so much is I've probably heard about 10 or 15 jobs that have been lost because they did not have the pilot's checklist, jobs that were kept because they had the pilot's checklist. That's an accommodation that just comes up over and over and over again. Definitely. I think the key here, as you mentioned, as you, as you emphasize, uh, Dr. Grandin, is skill development, to learn those skills to be successful and well, be independent right. for life. That's, well, and that's be proactive. Right. That's the key. And... and um, I don't do the I don't like the bar scene chit chat. One of the problems is I cannot hear it. Also, people do this social chit chat. They go back and forth, back and forth, and my brain isn't fast enough to follow it. Definitely. Well, Doctor Temple Grandin, I, you know you need to come back here again. We, you know this is your home. We always well. I would like to talk more about this with you in another time. Um, and 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 I'm truly honored and privileged for for you to take in, uh, from your time to be with us in this episode of my time with Tony Hernandez Pumaro. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me, and it's been great talking to you. Thank you. An awesome interview, indeed, with Dr. Temple Grandin. You know, every time that that I had the honor and privilege of talking with her, and you know, I even had the medium, I have the honor and privilege of meeting her one time in person. Is something that is very surreal for me, even to this very day. Uh, her experience, you know, history, you know, on, in autism and animal rights, and and her career and her as her story uh, is truly inspirational, as having impact around the world. And to have her in my podcast, it means a lot to me. So please share this interview with everybody that you know. Uh, spread the word about my podcast. If you haven't done so, please subscribe. And until next time, this has been another this has been another episode of my time with Tony Hernandez Pumarejo. And I wishing you have a wonderful day and God bless. Bye-bye. Well, this is the end of another episode of My Time with Tony Hernandez Pumarejo. Tony hopes you liked it. If you'd like to learn more about the work Tony does, subscribe to him on his social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, which is now X and his LinkedIn page. You can also follow Tony on his website at TonyHernandezPumarejo.com. Also, if you are interested in getting a copy of his book, An Autism Unscripted Life, you can purchase it on Amazon or any book selling platform. You can also obtain a copy through his website. So, until the next time you meet, thank you and have a wonderful day. Blessings. <laughs>